A pleasure to meet y'all at last, and welcome back to Kaiju Force Neo as a whole. Because now let's focus on something different here. A different subject that I can pretty much summarize on throughout what I've been doing so far. But instead of video games, let's try something different. How about films? Films, of course, that I've been watching, and I've been garnering tons of reviews on, especially with the series films I should have talked about years ago. Because now's the time I actually try this thing out. Because this is going to be something different. At some point, I might actually have to do a whole series of countdown videos, almost akin to what Watch Mojo has done over the years. But until anything like that does, in fact, become realized, let's do ourselves a top 12 best films that I've seen in 2021. Because not every film out there is supposed to be good, yet not every film out there is supposed to be bad. But yet you can look at it multiple ways. In my case, though, I've seen tons of films all over the place, left and right. Especially within the last three or four years. Now that I have access to a lot of these different apps, it is appropriate that I try something like this after all this time. 12 years, 12 films that I was basically able to put together very carefully and efficiently. But let's get on to it. We're starting off with number 12 of this whole entire thing, which, well, apparently of all picks that I've got here, Ice Age Collision Course, released in 2016, and is currently standing as the final entry in the Ice Age franchise. After nearly 15 long years since day one, you can't necessarily say that Ice Age has gone so far that it's ridiculous. With five films, plus short films, plus other things, here and there. It's safe to say that with Blue Sky Studios, you can expect a lot of things to take place. But yet, because the Ice Age franchise, plus robots, plus spies in disguise, and then of course with the Disney collab known as Horton Hears a Who in 2008, Blue Sky has gone on a relatively far, far pathway all the way till this past March, when they ended up having to be closed down. And now looking at all the things that have happened since their closure this past March, Blue Sky Studios really is little more than just a bad memory nowadays. And people are really trying to bring it back to the light. Ice Age Collision Course, however, is probably something out there that I never thought would take place. I really gotta admit, I have missed out on a lot of things. I did hear a lot about the fourth film in the franchise, Ice Age Continental Drift, nearly 10 years ago. And to know that the series has now gone on this far, I tell ya, it started with Ice Age all the way back in 2002. The same exact year that such films out there, like A Crazy Nights, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, John Q, and tons of other things pretty much have taken place. Then in 2006, there was Ice Age, The Meltdown. And later on in that year, there was actually a short film. But then in 2009, there came a third film, Dawn of the Dinosaurs, which brought up a whole new thing here and there, a whole new expansion to that of the franchise overall. At the time, I considered that to be the best that I've possibly seen. It was crazy. It was exciting, but it was almost because of the fact that I was just a kid back then, 10 years old in the year 2009. But then of course, by 2012, there came another film in the series, Continental Drift. But then of course, there had to be another one in 2016. Collision Course almost felt like an appropriate ending, given to the fact that the plotline does center around Scrap being launched into space on accident after finding a UFO somewhere in the world. But then ends up sending a meteor that would cause an extinction level event. 
hurtling towards Earth. And it turns out that the rest of the cast, all the characters and the like that we've seen so far, including Manny, Ellie, Crash, Eddie, and all the others pretty much that we've seen so far. It turns out that what they gotta do now is they gotta find a way to stop this asteroid before it causes total destruction and a life-threatening situation for them. But the whole thing that I see about this entire series overall is that a lot of people are claiming that they have no more original ideas and are just simply doing what they can for cash grabs. Well, what do they mean by no original ideas? The first film was about Manny and Ellie fighting each other and then they eventually find a human baby and they have to return the baby back to an entire tribe's worth of humans. And then the second film revolving around a literal meltdown almost confirming the very end of what the real life Ice Age was like. So it almost acted like something that was akin to what happened in real life millions of years ago. And then the third film, Dawn of the Dinosaurs, was when Sid ends up getting abducted after supposedly taking eggs from a dinosaur underground. Then the fourth film, of course, I probably have yet to watch that, but the whole thing about it is that, well, Continental Drift. It's almost like when real life Pangea got split apart into several different huge lands across the earth. One giant continent broke apart into several, and they all drifted across the world. So it's yet another very big accurate suggestion as to something that happened in real life history. And then of course there is the fifth film, Collision Course. 14 years after the release of the first film, quite a long run since that point in time but yet this one supposedly felt like it would have been a good send-off to finally end the series once and for all and to prevent anything from possibly happening again but no apparently of course if you've seen the film the ending does show the meteor get successfully deflected away from earth and everybody lives happily ever after it almost set the pace for a whole new line of sequels but believe it or not, there actually was some news that supposedly Blue Sky Studios was intending to reboot the franchise and set up a whole new line of sequels after that, beginning next year in 2022 and onwards pretty much until who knows when. But you know what though? Since they closed down this past March, I really got a feeling that all those people out there who are being so critical about these things out there revolving the franchise's longevity, it does go to show that some people almost feel like that they've won the battle when reality shows that Blue Sky Studios obviously couldn't handle the extreme economic changes that had happened over the past couple of years. So it had to go like many other companies did. But you know what though? I might as well say, at least for a film in the Ice Age franchise, I would have to give it a few excuses. Mostly for the fact that an asteroid striking the Earth actually is an original idea. I mean, an extinction level event, something new for the gang to pretty much counteract against and try to survive. That is certainly original right there. It started from a baby going out to them and they have to return the baby back to a family pretty much. Then there was a meltdown, then there was an abduction of, an, of a sloth in an underground world full of dinosaurs that apparently was never seen before. Then the fourth film showed the continental course taking place, akin to Pangea splitting apart. And then the fifth and final film shows an asteroid threatening to destroy the entire world. Like, I tell ya, the whole thing about the Ice Age series so far is that the characters have had tons of mileage. And with all the actors in place, I tell you, Ray Romano, Queen Latifah, John Leguizamo, all these other people out there, they've probably had a lot of fun. For 14 solid years since day one, they've basically been pretty big stars. Across the board, the characters, like many other characters in other franchises, like the Transformers, the Ghostbusters, 
and tons of other franchises out there. I mean, Ice Age may have carried on way too long, according to most people, and has gotten on a not-so-well path. Again, Blue Sky Studios, they were the original brains behind the operation the whole time. Between 2002 and 2016, we've seen so much that they've been able to accomplish. Like, oh man, how is it so hard to say nowadays? <sighs> Must be the Rotoshaw effect again. I hate it so badly, I am done with dirt. Okay, well. So overall, when it comes to giving this film a score, I can't be sure about it. 7.1 out of 10. That seems to be what's at the top of my brain, and that's probably going to be where it'll be at, probably for a while. So in the end, Collision Course, it's probably not, definitely not the best that we've seen so far. It could have been better. But yet, I'm still going to go out on a limb to say that because it's an Ice Age film, it was made by the same company that made all the other ones, Blue Sky Studios, and because of the fact that they closed down after they announced that they wanted to reboot the series starting next year. I mean, they had good intentions going down. They probably would have tried to revitalize the series to make it great again. Again, Collision Course is the last film now. And we have to live with that for the rest of our lives. So, that's just pretty much it there. You can stop thinking that they're going to keep going on with the series, but yet you can also stop hating on it for what it is. That's just it there. Number 11, Point Break. This film, released in 1991, stars Keanu Reeves, who would later become well-known as John Wick, as well as Carrie Ducey and Patrick Swayze. Of course, this was before I really got to know some of these actors very well, but the thing is, because I was able to watch this on HBO Max some time ago, a lot of the details are still fresh in my mind. Keanu Reeves is, in fact, a government agent who's wanting to seize in on a group of bank robbers who apparently disguise themselves as various presidents of the United States. Especially more obscure presidents. Presidents that not many people knew much about. And even by today's standards, when we have access to all the info that they've had all their lives, not many of us still remember them, quite frankly, as much as Washington or Lincoln or George Walker Bush. But the thing is, is that these bank robbers have made a lot of robberies, and Keanu Reeves' character is destined to take them all in for justice. But in order to do that, it apparently turns out that there is a surf group who might have connectivity with these robbers, and Reeves is therefore destined to go learn about surfing and attempt to become friends with them. So, as strange of an idea as that sounds, the whole thing is that it's a Keanu Reeves film, way, way ahead of the time when Reeves was even famous to begin with. But yet, when you really think about it, Reeves has already had quite a big film career, starting with the Bill and Ted duology in 1989 and 1991, and then, of course, with Point Break in 91 as well, then the following year with Bram Stoker's Dracula, then another two years with Speed, and then some others here and there, before eventually arriving to John Wick, where Reeves would apparently become one of the greatest sensations in acting history. So, of course, we also can't forget the Matrix trilogy. But, of course, it's John Wick that really kick-started Reeves' career entirely. As for Swayze and Ducey, well, like I said, this film was way before I ever got to know about them. I've best known Ducey from The Ginger Dead Man from 2005, and then exactly 10 years before then, there came the film Tall Tale, The Unbelievable Adventure. I'll always remember Patrick Swayze best from that in film entirely. Well, anyways, the comedy, the action, and the amazing satire of Point Break really gives us quite a huge look into what films are really about. They're about telling a lot of stories. A lot of stories about the true end of life itself. We need these kind of films a little more often nowadays. 
because it almost seems like we're not getting as much unhinged, insane action and lore from as much films today as there were back then. But even though a lot of films have more tolerances by the public view, especially with the fact that the internet has been exposing a lot of minors to so many things out there, it's really given us quite a message. Either we accept the reality behind it, or we continue fighting against the big, big system that makes billions upon billions of dollars and continues to have a lot of resources in them, as well as a lot of legal divisions. So we can never truly fight against hundreds of lawyers from companies like Universal or the Walt Disney Company. We can never fight against that. All we gotta do now is sit back and just wait for what's next. Well, anyways. Point Break, I give it a whopping 8.5 out of 10. Specifically for the fact that it is incredible for what it is. I will say for sure it's not quite as good as many of the other entries here, so again, 8.5 I give it just because I'm being a little generous here. Because let's go ahead and move on to number 10, which, well, is actually Bram Stoker's Dracula, released in 1992. The same exact year that a handful of other great films out there, like Alien 3 and some other things pretty much that I can't really seem to get off of the top of my head. But anyways, when it comes to Bram Stoker's Dracula, the same exact author who gave us the incredible original classic novel of the same name, Bram Stoker's Dracula, had given us quite a big underrated masterpiece from the early 90s that we never quite expected to show up ever in history. The big thing about this version of all the Dracula films out there, it really is probably the best that I've seen so far. And because I was able to watch it some time ago, sometime before I was able to watch other Keanu Reeves films out there, but well, let me just tell you that with Keanu Reeves, Gary Oldman as Dracula, as well as Winona Ryder, who's definitely become like the queen of horror films, especially with the more recent entry being the Stranger Things franchise. I'd say that's when Ryder was pretty much at the top of the world when it comes to horror and suspenseful acting. Well, anyways, this was, of course, Ryder's earlier days. And I will say that as an actor from the early 90s, what Ryder does a good job at what's pretty much taking place. But as for Reeves and Old Men, Reeves, of course, plays a journalist who is sent out to Transylvania to go find Dracula inside the castle. And it turns out, well, the Dracula in this film is unfreaking believable in appearance for the most part. But man, like how hilariously I mean, wow. Just wow. I cannot even afford to call that a flaw in the film. It is just way too good. I mean, of all appearances that Dracula has ever taken, what's with the double beehive style? I mean, are they trying to go for like the Princess Leia look, but give it a bit more of a steroid injection? Like, really? A double beehive style hairdo. Not to mention a large red robe that drags on the ground, much like most heroes and villains. But, man, I don't, almost don't even know where to begin from that. When I first saw that version of Dracula, it was way before I even got to watch the actual film. But, of course, I myself couldn't even trust my own vision my own hearing, my own taste, my own feel, my own smell, my own significance entirely. I could not trust a single femtosecond worth of my time that something like this would ever come up on the silver screen. Well, it was a color screen for the most part, but that's just incredible. How come we don't have any more Draculas like that? Why aren't we bringing back the 90s into today? Bring that version of Dracula back. Bring back the Pogs. Bring back the Sega. Bring back the everything in the entire world. 
Oh man, like that is just so, that is beyond crazy. But I would never, ever hold a grudge against something this undeniably silly. It is probably one of the most brilliant things that I've ever seen come out of comedic relief in my whole life. It's way better than so many things I've ever seen. The internet has a lot of great memories. But man, I practically underestimate the value of classic films. Oh man. So yeah, rather than talk about the rest of this thing, I'm just dropping the score right here. 8.9 out of 10. Dead serious. I'm going that high on that part. But yet, guess what? There's still a lot of other films here. So let's go on to number nine, The Ice Road. This was a few, this was one of a few films that I've actually talked about as a bonus on films I should have talked about years ago. Because occasionally I do find some brand new films out there and I sometimes watch them and I sometimes put them up as bonus features in the series itself. And The Ice Road was one of the first that I've done so far as was released back in June 2021 as a Netflix exclusive. But the thing is, it's a film that stars the likes of, well, our good old friends when it comes to acting. Liam Neeson, Lawrence Fishburne, and many, many others, pretty much. It is, in fact, a film that centers on the true stories. Well, it's loosely based off of the many true stories of how the many ice roads that take place in northern Canada are ba mm. they're basically used as a way for trucks to gather around supplies and tools and the like to various places around Canada, especially when most of the actual roads are busy or they're in fact blocked off because of things like avalanches and landslides or trees or other things. So of course, the usage of ice as roads, as substitutes for roads, they really do help. But in this instance, we have the likes of the almighty Liam Neeson pretty much going all in, taking in three large rigs worth of supplies over to a mining company. As a group of miners end up getting trapped inside one of the caves due to a methane gas leak which causes an internal explosion to take place. And as a result, it begins to cave in and the miners end up trapped with a lot of methane gas around them. They can't really breathe for very much longer, and that's a result, that's why these rigs are ended up coming to save the day. But yet, there's pretty much a big twist. It turns out that some of the employees who are hired to work on this apparently are working with a different company. A company who is wanting the miners to die. Now, as crazy as that sounds, I mean, the rest of the whole entire film is just what you think. It's almost average for pretty much what it is, but of course you've probably seen the episode by now, but in case you haven't, then well, I suggest you do, because that's also where I give out my official score on the film itself. <sighs> I tell ya, this right here is already getting too well here, because, well... Let's move on to number eight. Another film that I've talked about in films I should have talked about years ago called Rampage. This was released in spring 2018, around the same time that Pacific Rim Uprising and even the almighty Avengers Infinity War were released in theaters. It stars Dwayne The Rock Johnson, along with a giant white gorilla known as George, an albino gorilla, so to speak, who ends up getting mutated by some unknown ooze of some sorts, almost akin to like what happened in the origin story of the Ninja Turtles, at least most of the Ninja Turtles canon, so to speak, but anyways, George ends up growing large in size, and then of course there's also a wolf that grows gigantic in size, and even a crocodile that grows large in size, and yeah, for the record, it's another one of those video game adaptations. This one's based off of a classic arcade game of the same name, and, well, to tell you the truth, of all video game adaptations out there, it's almost unlikely to succeed when it comes to video game adaptations. From the very start, the end of the 80s, the early 90s, with such films out there like The Wizard, 
Super Mario, Double Dragon, Street Fighter the movie, Mortal Kombat the movie, and many others here and there. Then of course there was the duology of Lara Croft's Tomb Raider from 2001 to 2003 starring Angelina Jolie and then we had many others out there like the Resident Evil series which is still carrying on to this day. Then there of course was the very 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 obscure Dead Rising adaptations which probably don't even qualify as adaptations so to speak. And then of course there came Tomb Raider 2018 and then of course there's Rampage. 2018. At least for something like this, I will say that Dwayne The Rock Johnson is really an appearance that begs for everything to be seen, to be heard, anything to be desired. But the truth is, especially in this partake, so to speak, I will say, at least for Dwayne The Rock Johnson, this film probably will not at least be considered the best that we've seen by all performances that we've come to know about in Dwayne The Rock Johnson's film career so far because there have been way bigger and better examples out there over the past 20 years. And this I won't necessarily say is one of them, but at least I gave this film a good score. Again, be sure to check out films I should have talked about years ago if you're wanting to know more and if you're wanting to know about the official score I gave to this film. Because now's the time that we get on all the way to number seven, Rush Hour, 1998, with Jackie Chan and Chris Tucker at the hands of a dynamic duo of the late 90s and early 2000s. And of course, well, this is yet another film that I've talked about in films I should have talked about years ago because the entire trilogy pretty much had to be said. And I've said a lot about the trilogy itself. Although, of course, with the second and third films, I probably could have talked a little bit better about them. But in the end, I pretty much gave justice to the entire trilogy as a whole, and for a good reason. So, in a pinch when it comes to the first film entirely though, of course the first film is going to be better than the others, because they say the sequels are never guaranteed to be better. But yet, there are tons of examples out there where somehow sequels and reboots and the like even those that may not ever have any connection, somehow still tend to be successful. Yet again though, let's check out the main score. Whenever you see films I should have talked about years ago, you can always be sure that in any of those episodes, well, you'll always find out what the true score is that I've given to any of these films entirely. Then of course, we have number six, WW84. Yet another film I talked in films I should have talked about years ago. So let's go ahead and just blaze on through the rest of them, shall we? Number five, Greenland from 2020. A pretty good film starring Gerard Butler. What more could you expect about an apocalypse film that's almost akin to Armageddon or Deep, Deep Impact? Number four, Godzilla vs. Kong, 2020, of course. An amazing film entirely, but man, how else could you get any better with the legendary MonsterVerse? Number three, the Lego Batman movie. Yeah, this one I could probably talk a little bit about real quickly, though. This one stars Will Arnett, whom, of course, was already known in the first Lego movie from 2014, which also starred Chris Pratt and Will Ferrell. But I will at least say that, at least for a Batman movie based on the Lego-verse, the Lego-verse and the Batman universe coming together into one, man, what a combination. I'd probably give this film a pretty darn big score. Maybe it should be part of films I should have talked about years ago first. So, you know what? Let's just wait for that to come by. So, anyways, number two, Last Action Hero. This is yet another big example of an Arnold Schwarzenegger film where I could possibly talk about this one way, way further than I could have. But again, we'll probably wait a little bit for films I should have talked about years ago. At least a time where I could talk about this film entirely, just so we can have bigger details on it. But now, here we go. Number one, the best film that I've supposedly seen in 2021, The Suicide Squad. Yeah, Suicide Squad 2. Because there's already a film called Suicide Squad, but anyways, I have serious repercussions about this, the fact I somehow called this the greatest thing I might have ever seen in my whole life. 
For a brand new film that came out last month, the year 2021, the worst thing that we've ever had in our whole lives, this is an incredible example of irony. Somehow, the worst year in existence, in chronology, in history, in human life, in progression, in economic anything, somehow gives us the greatest masterpiece that we've ever had in American cinema. That is a total mind blow. Even I myself am baffled to just look back on my own words like that. It's like, am I insane? Have I been snorting lines of cocaine? No, that can't be the case. And I shouldn't even be talking about drugs, let alone mention their names. <sighs> but anyways, I mean, that was just crazy. To know that I somehow found this to be the biggest, bestest thing I might have ever seen in my whole life, in the worst year of all time, that is really an accomplishment. Somehow, this year turns over a new leaf almost overnight, just like that. But yet, well, we've been seeing a lot of things out there that managed to pretty much ruin it overall. So, it's right back to square one, definitely, and indubitably, so. The only thing that could save us now is by moving on to January 1st, 2022. That's the only thing around. No way around it. You can't go up, can't go down. You can only go straight through all the problems. So, oh man, I tell you, I gave it quite a nice score though, 9.5. But being another bonus that I made on films I should have talked about years ago, again, that's pretty much saying a lot. At least I'm going to go out on a limb to say that this film might as well just be the greatest thing we've ever seen in our whole lives. And that really is saying a lot. But again, how could I possibly hold back my honesty when I've seen what I've seen such a film like that? A large group of DC villains banding together to fight a giant starfish? What an impressive turnaround that we've seen in American cinema. Avengers Endgame was absolutely overrated and really didn't have much of a reason to exist other than grabbing billions of dollars worth of hard workers money pretty much. Yet this is a film where we can really agree on is so much better than everything we could have ever seen in the history of our lives. I am not kidding around here when I say that. So just go watch the film for yourself, if it is still on HBO Max. So, that's probably going to cut it for today, but I will tell you, at least, that I myself am actually looking forward to what a lot of other things are going to showcase, but maybe I'll do more countdown videos eventually within the next few months. Until any more of them show up, though, if you want to see more go down on my channel, then make sure that you like, subscribe, comment, follow me on social media, and stay on the Hollywood side.